Oh, nothing. Let it rise. We never know. Uh, so we look at Colin Davis. Colin Davis. Colin Davis. So those songs. So I chose Heart of Worship and um, I chose Heart of Worship and um, what was the other one? The Hit Heroes in Heaven because uh, Heart of Worship, you know, ten years ago or whatever that was, and Heroes in Heaven about you know two years ago. Very relevant, uh, 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 great songs that speaks our heart to the Father, and I believe it also speaks his heart to us. Here, here's what I love about that. Um, I'll bring you more. I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself. We got it. There's not what you have required. Almost. All right, so the beauty is I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself oh, is you. not what you require. That's why I keep saying that worship, worship. is not just the song. Worship music, oh. rather. But worship is not just a song. Worship yeah, music yeah. is a result of the Life heart that is surrendered music. and knows how to give up everything once again. Right? So so the, the song, as a songwriter said, you didn't require a song from me, but you're looking much deeper within, right? For the things that really matter. You're looking into my heart. A man or woman who sings from their heart will always sing the truth, watch this, no matter what year it is and no matter how long ago it's been. A man or woman who sings from their heart will always sing the truth, the truth of the Father. They will always sing that truth no matter what. Nothing? He has the clip though. Okay. So we're waiting for David, uh, Holland to uh, join us. Oh, so Holland, so Holland join, I don't know how, y'all got to tell me what's, what's going on because he, he's watching. There's a Oh, so go to the new live video, and then, we and, can add them. and then we'll add you, and then I'm gonna cut this one off, and we'll. I don't know how this is gonna work. Actually, we can keep it going. I'm, that's what I'm thinking. I said, I said, keep it going. Okay, cool. So, um, so you you gotta sing from your heart. Um, one of the things that I like to teach musicians is that playing from the heart versus playing from the chart, and it doesn't have to be verses. It doesn't have to be verses. It can very well be both. But sometimes we get musicians and singers who play from the charts, sing from the charts. This is what it is. This is how the song goes. I've always taught our musicians, let's, let's play the song just as we heard it on the record, right? Record, I'm 45. And then let's go ahead and do what we feel for the record. Let's do what we feel. So, but we're not going to abuse it so much, all right? So I got Holland Davis here. So here's what I'm going to do. What's up, Holland Davis? <laughs> right. What's up? Hey, man. So I got a, another. Yeah. Yeah. So, so hey, listen. This is. Petty. I've started another. Everybody, go over to the other one. All right. It's still me, but I started another one. Everybody, go over there. I want to see the numbers go down here and come up over here. All right. So, um, I got Holland Davis on, and we're gonna chop it up about uh, um, his song and what he's doing now and what we as songwriters, especially for worship, uh, how we can be better at what we do and better serve. All right, so everybody, I'm just going to keep on talking over here. So I, I intend to see y'all shut it down on, on this one, and then we'll go over to the other one. Hey, Holland, how you doing, brother? Good. How you doing, man? Fantastic, man. It's been years, right? Ten years, maybe? Wow. Has it been that long? This is amazing. This is like cutting edge. <laughs> it is. It's cutting edge with all the mistakes. <laughs> all of the. I liked it, man. That time of worship is sweet. Yeah. Oh, I got to switch the camera. I don't know. Thank you, Andre. I'll just get him on playing. Uh, here. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. There it is. Boom. We got it. So, um, I got broadband issues. Um, okay. So Holland, I'm waiting till, see, I see the numbers decreasing over here and coming up over here. All right. I'm kind of waiting till you hear me good. Yeah, I hear you. Great. Okay. Awesome. Hey, what have you been up to, man? Well, um, a few years ago we started a church and, uh, we did it old school. We started with eight people and, um, now we got like 150. We're getting ready to move into our first building. Wow. 
So it's just been exciting. Where now? Where are you again? Some some exotic name, San Capistrano. What is it? We're we're in our church is in San Clemente. We live in San Juan Capistrano, but our church is in San Clemente. Okay. And um, I mean, oh, I got you. Compared to where you are, it's paradise. I'm just saying. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely. What, what's the name? What's the name of your, uh, your fellowship? It's Calvary Chapel San Clemente. Got you, San Clemente. This is awesome. So uh, about ten years ago, um, uh, 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 Holland and I were at a conference. It was a uh, Morris Chapman. Right? right. Yeah, Papa Morris. Papa Morris, yeah. an amazing songwriter himself, yeah. and uh, I was fortunate to be able to come out to Arizona. That's where I met uh, Holland and uh, another good friend of mine, Carrie Godwin, for the first time. Carrie and I were both from North Carolina, oh, wow. and I, I didn't know him at the time, but we developed a great relationship since then. Amazing. I'm going to have Carrie on here at some point. Uh, amazing guitarist. He taught, I want to play guitar. I used to play <laughs> when I was a kid, but now my son is my son is now taking it over. But um, he's a, uh, an amazing guitarist, but he's a I mean, you want this guy playing for you when you're doing the song of worship because he he knows how to interpret and That's take awesome. you take you right there. So um, yeah, so so anyway, uh, we met. Holland did an amazing song. What what was that song, Holland? That um, what was that song? You know what? It was like I think it was a spontaneous song. It was like written right there. I think. Oh wow! And so like I don't even know. I mean, I, as you know, sometimes the Lord drops those in on you, and you just don't know if, you know you like it was for the moment okay cool cool yeah that was amazing and um we were um we we were uh we were blessed by by what you were doing um but it was it was a thrill for me to find out that I was in the the presence of the guy who wrote uh them that background to that story oh the let <laughs> let it rise yeah it's it it's an you know, it's one of those songs that you, um, it's even hard to talk about writing a song like that because I don't feel like I wrote the song. I felt like the song was just kind of given to me. It was almost like it just dropped in on me. And um, I was at a Bible study in in um, Pacific Beach, actually. And the church I was at, uh, Calvary Chapel, Pacific Beach, they had a Bible study that met in this coffee shop right on the beach boardwalk so you know mm -hmm. we're getting ready to you know play for this coffee sh for this uh, bible study and the whole place was just very distracting it was like people were walking in and out of the the shot the the area there they were buying coffee they're eating sandwiches i got you i think he froze <laughs> We'll get it back. Uh oh. Rut row. Okay. We'll get them back. Um, from my end, it, um, it's good. Yeah. So I think I just lost them. All right, so there was there was a question right here that's from Julius James. Julius James said, what happens when a born worship leader is so discouraged, depressed, and hurt by the church? What should he or she do? I'm hurt and confused. <clears throat> um, so that's interesting because it's kind of loaded because he said, what happens when a born worship leader is so discouraged? And I'm assuming you mean someone who was really... Um, who, who understands their purpose and leading people into the place of worship and all that kind of good stuff. Um, here's what I got to say to every person who believes that they're called to be a minstrel and to be just to, to lead people into the sound of worship. Understand who you're doing it for first. Hurt will come. Heartbreak will come. The very institution that birthed you into salvation, birthed you into knowing who the Father is, sometimes, most times, will hurt you because the whole idea 
of getting everything you need from the church has been a fallacy for so long. And church or the fellowship simply should be a place where we come to be reminded of how good God is. It should be a place where we come to be edified based on what you already know. So if persons, if the institution hurts you, it will happen. It is inevitable. It will happen. Then you have to put it in perspective and realize that you're not dealing with this Holland again, oh, that you're not dealing with God. The church should not equal God. Oh boy, that's tough. Because if the, if the church hurts you and in your mind, the church equals God, then guess what? then somehow God just hurt you too. And that is insane. So, so you have to know who you are. You have to know who you sing to. You have to know that worship is not about the song. It's not about the music. It is about your con the condition of your heart that is in a position or posture of constantly giving. That's what it is. So, so, so you have to also do your work. There you're back. There you go. You good? I'm good. Good. Okay. All right. So I was just I was just finishing up a question. So so anyway, this person dealing with church hurt and all this other kind of stuff and depressed time. You're gonna hit the wall sometimes. You will. As much as you're serving and, and services, and sometimes some of y'all have five services on a Sunday. The wall. Like Mario Andre, that's not tasteful. All right, you're gonna hit the wall like a race car driver, and uh, and and trust me, you have to know how how to back off, how to go someplace and refuel yourself because you're constantly pouring out, and you need to allow the Father to fuel to uh, to um, get you get, to get you right again. All right, so I want to I want to backtrack and go back into Holland's um, the creation of Let It Rise, and uh, go ahead and pick it up. You were you were at um, a service somewhat, right? Right, right. We were, it was actually a service that was in the coffee shop. And, um, right. and the thing is, is that it was so distracting. And it, I just didn't feel like we were prepared, you know, as a band. And, you know, the pressure that you feel as a worship leader when you're not prepared for something, and you just feel overwhelmed by that. And so, um, you know, it seemed like the songs weren't coming together, it just wasn't flowing. So we stop for prayer before the service is supposed to start, like in five minutes. And as we're praying, I'm just playing these chords over and over. But in my heart, I'm crying out to the Lord. I'm just like, Lord, if you don't change the atmosphere here, if you don't, if your glory doesn't fill this place, if you don't change this room from this, you know, coffee shop into a house of worship, it's just going to be a disaster. And, it's, and, and I just started just saying, you know, let the glory of the Lord just rise in this place. You know, let the praises wow. of the Lord just rise. Let, let the songs of the Lord just rise in this place. And so we went and um, right before we, uh, we started, I turned to the band and I just said, play these three chords. And um, <laughs> they started playing these three chords with me. And I turned around and I just started singing. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. And it was and it was really just a cry to the Lord. And as soon as we started singing it, it was as if the room paused, like the time stopped in this room. People stopped eating. They stopped uh, talking. They, they just put down their food and they lifted their hands and they began to worship the Lord and sing the song as if they were completely like, like they had known the song their whole life. And um, and it was just one of those unforgettable moments, you know, where God just and basically we sang it the way it's saying today. It was just it came out the way wow. it's it um, that we do it today. And the way it ended up on a record is we uh, I was invited by Malcolm Duplessis to come to a to Maranatha Music, and they were they wanted us as worship leaders to come and give our feedback on songs that they were thinking on putting on albums. And when we got there, they said, well, you can listen to our songs or we can listen to your songs. And so we would rather listen to your songs. And they flipped the tables on us and, you know, went around the room and finally, you know, came to me. And so I had all these songs that churches in our area were already doing. 
and I began to just play these songs and you know they would just say no that's not a you know that's not it pass 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 you know and that happened like two or three times and after a while I'm thinking maybe that's why you guys don't have any good records because you don't know any good songs when you hear them you know I just was getting really frustrated and they and they I went through all the songs they had and they finally says do you have anything else and I said well I've got this one song it's not even a song it's an idea it's just kind of this spontaneous moment that happened and I sang let it rise and the whole room just went that's the song and and Wow. And they said, we got to have it. Paul Velosh is in the studio. We need we need it tomorrow. Can you get it to us tomorrow? We're going to record it, put it on. It was on Praise Band 7. Then it was on Promise Keepers. Then it, it then. Billy Graham events and Harvest Crusades. And it just went all around the world. Literally just like wildfire. And um, I wish I well, could take credit for it, but I can't. It's all the Lord's doing, you know. <laughs> yeah, you, you said something so interesting. Um, musicians who might be watching, you said, play these three chords. Yeah. <laughs> See, I was listening to you do worship. I don't know those expensive chords. I didn't go to that. <laughs> so, like, I only know the cheap chords, you know. Yeah. And, uh, they- and so... The way I get expensive, but I didn't buy them. I stole them. I break a string, I keep going, and that's how it sounds expensive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I, like I say, I, I, um, I love the simplicity of it, and I always tell people that's why how great is our God is so effective because it is so simple, and um, the verses are the same. The chords and the verses the same as the, um, the chorus. And, and the verses are the same. Right. And uh, I had a, a real good musician friend of mine in Florida who's a phenomenon. Like both of his hands um, should be cast in some type <laughs> of a special gold, gold play. But he's good. He's amazing. So anyway, we were singing the song and he asked me, he said, so if I did this chord and he flipped it, some jazz, some whatever he did, he says, would that bother you? I said, absolutely it would. Because for me, the purity of those songs is what attracted me in the first place. Yeah. So I want to I want to keep it as as close as possible. I want to keep it there. Now, that's nothing to be said about interpretation because right. everyone has a different interpretation. As a matter right. of fact, share you you said back then that of all of the renditions that you heard that there was one particular rendition or or cover of the song that that kind of got it right. What was oh, it? Do you remember? Yeah, that? it was a uh, Bishop William Murphy and um, yeah. he, he, when he did his version of it, um, it captured the heart that I was feeling when I wrote the song. Yeah. It, it sounded like a cry out to God. Um, now, yeah. the, like the Big Daddy Wee version went to number three in the nation, and I got an award yeah. for it uh, because of their version of it. And um, and it and it definitely captures the energy of the song and just the excitement of the glory of God being in a place. Uh, but William Murphy yeah. captured the heartbeat, you know? And what's interesting is that I, I see a lot of people doing his version of the song. And I think it's for that yeah. reason, because it, it, it really did capture that cry. Cause it really was, um, it really was a, for me in that moment, it wasn't a celebration song. It was a heart cry. I was crying out to mm. God yeah. out of desperation. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome, man. Um, <clears throat> let's kind of dissect it a little bit. So let the glory of the Lord rise um, among us. So so kind of walk me through that a little bit. Why is it rising and not falling? Um, well, as I was looking at this room, it was almost like I saw, you know, this visual, uh, if you will, of like, water coming into the room and like the presence of God just wow. filling this room up is literally how I saw it. And so as I saw the the presence of God, the glory of God to me was all synonymous. And it was like, I just wanted mm. all the people in this room just to be underwater, you know, <laughs> under God's glory, just like completely wow. over the top, yeah. you know? And, uh, and so that's kind of what I saw. I saw like, I saw this, you know, the same thing and then worship just, rising out of their hearts up to the Lord, you know, 
And um, mm -hmm. so it was, it was, it was really kind of this sense of, I, I really, you know, out of desperation saw this room as it was a restaurant. I mean, people were in swimsuits mm -hmm. and, you know, it's in Pacific beach, it's on the <laughs> boardwalk, right? right? You know, 10 feet mm -hmm. out there is the beach. And it was just so, um, it was not a conducive environment for worship. Right. Well, you know, and it's like I, it, I I just saw the Lord just completely transforming um, the atmosphere of the place. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is um, I remember the first time I heard it saying at L.A. Coliseum, it was at a Promise Keepers event and there were 80,000 guys. And Whoa. as soon as the Promise Band just started singing the song that the Lord of the Lord rise, it changed the atmosphere of that whole place. It's like all of a sudden wow. there was just the sense of the presence of God. And um, it was the same sense we had in that little restaurant, you know? And, um, and so I, that's wow. kind of what was going on in my mind as I was thinking yeah. those lyrics. How does it make you feel? I mean, let's, let's, let's um, just, just personally, just as a man, how does it make you feel knowing that the father used you to pin that and you've heard that? all over the I, world i have to tell you it is um i mean it when i sat and heard those guys singing at the la coliseum i just started weeping um because when i was i want to say when i was like 13 or 14 um i i would have these dreams of of like masses of people in a in a, in a stadium worshiping the lord together and uh, in, mm -hmm. in those days that didn't happen you know that just wasn't a reality right. and so i it was like a big dream of mine to see people from different races from different denominations from different groups all unified uh to worship the lord in this massive stadium and i was there you know i, I saw myself there and so when mm -hmm. i was when I saw it from with my own eyes and I was there, it was like the Lord was just saying, this is, this is what he basically, he let me know that that was something he put in my heart. It wasn't just like this dream I yeah. had. It was really something God had put in my heart that he was bringing into fruition. And so for me, it was humbling. It was, it was a, a moment of just like, you know, just, just, um, you know, finally seeing God get yeah. the glory that he deserves and seeing mm -hmm. all these people come together to set aside their differences, to be unified under the banner of Jesus Christ, just to worship the Lord. That was probably the highlight of my life up until that point. That's awesome, man. Um, man, what, what, a what an amazing, I love the background to uh, to to that that's something that we've all sang. Um, there are probably a lot of songwriters who are watching now um, who want to know what does it take to hear that song from the Lord. You know what I mean. And even if it's <laughs> not something that's going to be published, you know what I'm saying. Because a lot of people think there's a magic pill, right. right? Right. And they think there's a magic process to doing it because. The market has become so competitive, especially in Christian and gospel music, that people are always, you know, we're always forced to like, what's the next hit? Write one just like that. So it's, it's become right. a homogenized process. Let what, what what's your heart on? Well, like, on that? When I teach, someone who has when I teach these. songwriters, the what? first thing I tell them is, I've never written a song for a record. I've never written a song to be recorded, to sell records, to make money. Um, I, I've always written songs for my local church. And I believe that God gives worship leaders songs for their local congregation. And um, mm -hmm. I've been blessed to be able to know guys like Tommy Walker and Chris Tomlin and Paul Balash mm -hmm. and, 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 when you hear their story, um, they're all just local church guys. They lead worship at right. their local church and they write songs for their local church. And, but, you know, God has taken their songs and has, you know, elevated them or, you know, other churches have taken them, learned them. And so 
you know, and so it's just kind of this new thing that's happened, but they were first presented in their local church. And so um, I've never written a song to be sung outside of my local church, but God is the one that takes a song and he breathes on it and he gives it legs and he takes it places. I mean, Let It Rise has been in more places than I'll ever be. I mean, they, they oh, sing yeah. Let It Rise in Fiji. And uh, of course, my big dream, my mm -hmm. wife's biggest dream is to go to Fiji on vacation. And uh, <laughs> so Let It Rise has been there, yeah. but we haven't been there, you know? So, yeah, exactly. uh, it, and that's the power, that's what God can do. God takes something, you know, God took David when he was out tending yep. the, the flock and his, his own dad didn't want David, you know, in to talk to the prophet. He put all his, his older brothers there. And yet the prophet goes, hey, there's one missing. Who is it? You know, go get him. And because he's the one. And I think sometimes we forget that it's God that elevates it. God, it's God that promotes it. God, it's God that takes a song and it's not me. It's not good marketing. It's not a record company. It's not a publishing deal. It's the Lord. And um, the Lord is the one that does that. And when we keep that straight in our mind, then we can get free from all of that. Oh, I got to create the next hit. I'm just writing for the yes. guys that I lead worship for every day and um, at my church. And if God breathes on a song and it goes beyond that, then praise the Lord, you know, but if it never goes beyond that, then, and, and the people in my church love the song, um, then well, praise the Lord. That's all it was there to do. Yeah. yeah. That is, man, you, you just, wow. That's, that's, man, that's, that's the heart right there. <laughs> write it for your, write it for your local church, not necessarily for an album. And I understand people are under contract, they're under pressure and they got to produce some big, huge hit because they want everybody um, to buy it. Um, what you said reminded me of, and I'm, I'm kind of pulling it up here, reminded me of Psalm 18. It says, to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, yeah. who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day of the Lord, delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies. Yeah. And David wrote those songs and then sent those songs to chief musicians in other places mm -hmm. and Obviously, there was no uh, net. And so he would tell them, sing it to this tune. Sing these lyrics. Right. Sing these words to the tune of this song, to the tune of that song. And that's how David uh, would get it, would, would distribute. Now, am I correct? What's Pretty much his song. What's interesting is that, you know, people, uh, I had the privilege of um, serving with Pastor Tim. I think I'm losing you. Are, are, you got your uh, mic covered? No. Can you hear me okay? I hear you. I hear you a little okay. bit. Okay. Well, um, I want to make sure we hear. You hear me good? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I, one of the, okay, gotcha. I had the privilege of serving with Pastor Chuck Smith. And uh, Pastor Chuck Smith is uh, legendary. Um, he's in history books. Uh, basically, he's, you know, credited with founding the whole praise and worship movement. Um, and the whole Jesus, yeah. you know, mute movement, you know, this, the contemporary Christian music industry. And, um, and one of the things that I learned from Pastor Chuck is that, um, you know, when different people would come to him, you know, with, with the songs that Maranatha Music was putting out, um, they would ask him, hey, Chuck, we want to we wanna take your songs, you know, Calvary Chapel songs, and we want to translate them into Spanish. We want to translate them into Chinese. We want to we want to do them in Australia, you know, can we do them? And how much will you charge us? And, and Chuck would say, it's free. Just use the songs, just, you know, be blessed. Wow. And he yeah. did not put the industry onto the songs. What happened is those hmm. songs went around the world. And, and soon every nation was singing the songs that came from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And of course, when oh. CCLI came along, guess what happened? There was a lot of revenue that came to Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa um, because those songs were around the world. He was generous with what God had given him. I think because oh. of the industry, songwriters have forgotten how to be generous. Um, we've forgotten how to take our songs and let them be the songs of the people. 
and um, and when the mm. song and when the people own the songs, they're gonna sing them everywhere. They're gonna pass them on it, because it becomes their song. They're gonna sing it around the world, and then of course mm. the writers benefit through organizations like CCLI or other. Now I have other artists recording my songs, and it's kind of exciting. So they've heard songs, and so it's, it's kind of an exciting thing, you know. And so God yeah. is still, that's how I'm able to do our church, how we're able to do the ministries that we're able to do is because of how God has blessed the songs. But we've been generous with them. Man, wow. So you've been generous with the songs. And when they have the song of the Lord, it you're not concerned about where it goes what what you do know is that the father does the rest. I always say that ours is not to know how it's going to happen. It's just to um, to make ourselves available or our resources, whatever we have, make it available, yeah. and then let the father do the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that's so awesome. I see a lot of uh, my friends. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, that's just really how. Um, that's the practical aspect of it, you know. And there are things you can do to get your songs heard. I mean, social media is so great. Um, what a lot of times what I do is is I put the songs out there rough and raw. So it's mm. like guitar, voice, simple, no production. And, and what happens is if it's a great song, people are going to want to sing that song. They don't need to have uh, a U2 riff happening in the background like every other worship song has. Um, they don't have, to have the Holy <laughs> Spirit keyboard, you know, the little the Nord patch right. that has the Holy Spirit on it. Um, right. and when you take all of that away and you have right. the song, you know, and it's in its simplest yeah. form, if it's anointed, if there's a breath of God on it, it's going to go viral. It's just going to happen. So let me ask you this because I'm looking at I'm looking at my phone and I got like very little percentage. Um, but let me ask you this: <clears throat> what, how how do you feel about I call it worship theater, and it's not to take away from real, real authentic worship moments. But what do you feel about what we are doing in our churches on Sunday mornings in terms of the staging and the lights and the smoke machines and the whole thing? What what's your, and I'm not against it. I'm not. I just want to know what your what your take is. But see, because I grew up around the stage, um, I'm not I'm not affected by those things. Um, I actually mm -hmm. like some. I like lighting. I like the mood setting. I like all of that sort of stuff. I love it especially when it matches what is happening. Um, but mm -hmm. I know there are there are folks that are greatly affected by it, and so. Um, in our church, we do simple church. You know, it's we don't have a lot of lighting. We don't have a lot of those things because um, it affects people. You know, we, we have people that came to our church that had um, epilepsy. And so when you have like flashers, you know, and all this streaming lights and stuff, it it affects them physically. And so, you know, out of love, because even though I love lights, out of love, we got rid of lights, you know, so that we could give them a place where they could worship the Lord, you know? And so yeah. I think anything you do motivated by love, you know, something that you love to do some, and it's your way of loving the people. But if you're doing something cause you want to be cool or you're trying to be relevant or you're trying to really reach the people, um, you know, what's crazy is all these people talk about the youth and how techie they are. And what I have found is that youth, aren't all as techie as what people think. Um, they like Snapchat. They like Facebook. They like Instagram. Um, and because they like to connect with people. And that's yeah. really what it's all about. It's about connecting with people. And, and if you're connecting with people in worship and you're connecting people to God in worship, um, that's really what it's what it comes down to. You know, it's not about the flash and the the coolness of it um that's never connected me to god it's never connected people i know who are worshipers young and old to god it's always been a relational thing that connects them to god 
Yeah, sometimes it helps, and sometimes it can be a, a distraction. Um, I've seen it. You know, I'm a, I'm a love of good loud music. I love to, I love the the subwoofer and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but I honestly love that we did those moments because it's kind of what I come up on. I cut my teeth on it. Those moments of just honestly sitting at a piano or with an acoustic good the heart of the father singing your heart to the father and singing his heart for us is what really gets it for people. yeah i've seen people get their peace of mind in those moments you know what i'm saying like yeah. just struggling all day and trying to figure out like why am i here and why am i struggling why am i going through this and that and in those moments i've seen people just kind of really get it back you know what i'm saying yeah i mean I, i've led worship in mega churches where you can't see anybody. Now we're in a little church plant. Um, and we started, you know, from the ground up. And so it's, it's, um, it's, it's different when you're looking in the eyes of people and you see them worshiping the Lord. And you're looking at a guy and you're going, man, that guy was delivered from drugs. Look at him, he's worshiping the Lord. And then you look at right. another person and it's like, wow, that, that person's marriage was on the rocks. And now God has healed their marriage and look at them worshiping the Lord. And, you know, that person just lost, you know, a loved one. And, and yet they're worshiping the Lord. There's, when you can actually see God, you know, the fruit, there's just something different about leading worship in that environment. Um, it, it makes your so worship cool. leading much more personal, much more relational, much more focused on, the spirit of God, you know, when you're in a big crowd, it's, it's harder for to discern what the Holy Spirit is actually doing in a room because you can manipulate people just with the sound and the lights and everything else. And you can create an right. experience, a pseudo experience that where they think right. they're experiencing God when they're not, they're just feeling the, you know, the subwoofer in their chest and they feel like, Oh, God is speaking to me. Yeah. It's like, no, we actually know what the physics behind that, and that's just you know that's just subwoofer, you know. Whereas, right. um, whereas now as we're leading worship, we're looking at people's faces that Jesus has transformed their life, and that's there's nothing like that. That's just awesome. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, and that's what we're starting to see more of now is that people want more of authenticity and not manufactured experiences. And that's, um, if we're not careful, we will wing people from authenticity into manufactured moments and they won't recognize what is God and when is God actually moving into place because with, with everything that's going on, I mean, honestly, some people get lost in it, like, oh, yeah, this is it right here, until they actually have the experience, and I've seen it, when they actually have the experience, like, when they really experience God, it's this weirdness, like, oh, I thought that was God. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> oh, this is, you know what I'm saying? It's like, this is God. And it's like, I, I want to, you know, sometimes just cut the lights on, no music, just the piano or whatever, and just voices, and just just sing. And just you know, just let it let it roll. Somebody asked a question a minute ago. Um, who do you listen to in your worship time? Oh, personally, who am I listening to? I I am I listen to everybody because I'm just always um, I'm wanting to learn. I'm also exper you know wanting to see what God is doing in different places, and so um, you know I the most recent stuff I've listened to is from, um, it's called, uh, oh, what is it called? Um, he's, uh, it's, uh, wait, I've, I have my iTunes here. I'll look it up. Um, it's like bread and, and the altar or something like that. Uh, oh, yeah. Bread and yeah. Wine. You know what that is? They're called bread and wine. Bread and wine. Yeah. Okay. And it's just, it's very simple. Um, but, you know, they're very, very similar to like United Pursuit, which is also very simple. Okay. 
And um, I've been listening to House Fires, you know, before they got big and got discovered by yeah. Chris Tomlin. It's like I've, I've been listening to them for a while. And I like, yeah. I like to listen to people that where they're just hungry for the presence of God. And they're going, yeah. that's what they're going for. Um, I've been, I've recently, I heard the new, um, Hillsong record, um, and I've been listening to, um, the, um, the new acoustic elevation worship, um, stuff. Mm. Um, but a lot of times I'll just go back to the, to old school worship that I kind of cut my teeth on, you know, stuff, you know, know from it. Marinoff the music and different things. Cause yeah those songs are still anointed. They're still anointed by God. You know, we exalt thee. Yeah. Um, I love you, Lord. You know, there's just, there's something on those songs. And, uh, yeah, yeah. and there's a song that, that I sang, um, that I used to sing. And I don't know that there's even a recording of it. I heard it by ear and then I found something on YouTube. Um, but it's a song called my first love. And um, where it's like, my first love is Jesus. And, you know, and it's the whole chorus is Jesus. You're my first love, how I love you. And, um, and, I, and every time I sing, I still weep. You know, it's been years singing that song. I still yeah. weep. Uh -huh. I can't even, I can't really yeah. even play it in public because I can't do yeah. the song, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, but once again, you know, when, when does that sentiment lose its, effectiveness right i've been married 24 years this year and me telling my wife should never lose its effectiveness it's like no i still love you it's like this is our 24th year but i as a matter of fact i love you more now right than, than i did in the, in the first That's year good. you keep saying that so, yeah. <laughs> i will keep saying that she's watching right now trust me <laughs> but I, but I, you know, but but I do. It's like it'll never lose its effectiveness because it's it just the truth. Hey, real quick, um, Nicole Marie is asking: Do you prefer to write in groups, co-writing, or write on your own? And how much influence do you like for others to to have? If you're not counting the publishing splits. Well, I actually um, have started co-writing recently, and because uh, most of my songs come out of my prayer time. That's mostly how I write is I have the Bible open and I'm, and what I tell songwriters is you pray, you, you sing your, your prayers. Instead of praying your prayers, you sing your prayers because yeah. you sing from a different part yeah. of your brain and it, you use a whole different way of writing when you do that. And so a lot of my yeah. worship songs are sung prayers that are coming out of the scriptures. Um, but recently I've been writing with um, some different guys. I wrote with Josh Lavender, who is, um, uh, he's a, a Wesleyan worship leader in Indianapolis. Um, I've written with Greg Fadness, who's at Lighthouse Christian Fellowship in, um, uh, in Twin Falls, Idaho, and with another guy that's with Seeds Worship. And, um, and it's a different, it's different when you're in a writing group, you know, because it, it definitely is a, a shared experience. And but I and so when I approach that writing experience with someone else, I'm not trying to dominate. I'm not I'm really open to uh, letting a song that I bring an idea that I bring be completely transformed. And we just wrote a song mm -hmm. called Your Presence um, that I had just this idea of a chorus and it was very simple, again, born out of prayer, but I thought, you know what, there's there's something to this song. I think it needs to be expanded. So when I brought it to Josh and we started talking it through, you know, Josh just graduated from Robert uh, Weber School of Worship. He's got this theological brain, you know. So he's bringing all this mm. church history and all this theology into the song. And mm. But I was taking his ideas and his theology and simplifying it and making it experiential and saying, no, that's a great concept, but we need to keep in mind we're mm -hmm. experiencing and we're in the presence of God. Now I'm going to take yeah. that concept and say it back to God in a way that puts me in the moment. And it was, it was a great, yeah. um, the, the way we worked together was really well. And it was a great back and forth because um, we were able to come up with a song that has good theological depth 
and yet it's a song that's in the moment that keeps you uh, in that place of experience in the presence of God, you know? So, so when I'm yeah. collaborating, I'm, it's a totally different thing. I'm totally open to whatever comes out. You know, I have no expectations. Yeah. I don't, I don't put ownership, my ownership on it. You know, it, I let it be a group thing. Um, if I yeah. feel that's imp that close to a song, I won't bring it into a group setting. I'll just, you know, just between yeah. the Lord, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I totally get that. Hey, listen, um, I appreciate you taking out time. It's always good to see you, man. Talk to you. Yeah, it's good to see you, um, too. I love the beard. <laughs> thank you, brother. Thank you. This is, this is all natural right here. I, that's, um, that's so awesome. Yeah. Um, likewise, I see you. I see you got some wisdom in yours as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm the Japanese Santa Claus. <laughs> hey man thank you i hope everybody enjoyed this um you were able to get your questions answered and whatever you know we were able to uh, help out on something um I'm, what am i getting right now oh i don't know what that question means on fab i don't know what that means um so they, I get, yeah they want i guess they want to connect with you on facebook so how He froze again. All right. So he'll he'll be back, I think. Um, but look him up. Um, what was his what was his Facebook? Um Holland Davis. Holland Davis. It's that simple, I think. Yeah, yeah look him up. Ho Holland Davis, everybody. Um looking look him up. I'm I'm pulling it up now. Yeah, it's very simple. Holland Davis, he's the senior pastor and founder at Calvary Chapel San Clemente. So um connect with them there. And uh, man, the great guy. I love when the father connects me to um, uber talented people, but are crazy humble and just good people, right? We need to be good people first. And then, um, and then the father can use our gifts. So anyway, thank you all for hanging in there. Um, there's two videos now, obviously the first one with the worship and this one here. So I appreciate you. Hey, listen, share this like it, do all that other kind of good stuff, and um, I'll be back later on this week. I want to be talking to musicians about what I see and what I feel. And I know I'm not crazy, but I want to be talk talking about musicians, about what I see and, and what I feel, um, uh, what's going on with you all. I want to hear from you, as a matter of fact. Wh wh where's your heart? In this, like when you play on Sunday mornings, when you play throughout the week, like honestly, where's your heart, man? Are you are you hitting the wall and you're not telling anybody um, what's going on inside of you? Like, where's your relationship with the Father? Your relationship has to happen outside of that church. It's got to. If your if your relationship with the Father is activated just when you step inside the church, then you need to recalibrate. You got to recalibrate. Your relationship has to be at home on the job, in the car. It has to be, man, that thing. Man, man, man must be left alone to discover himself. One of my favorite quotes by um, um, one of my favorite writers uh, of uh, Science of Mind, uh, Ernest Holmes. Man must be uh, left alone to discover himself. And if we're not taking some time alone, go out, sit by the water, go out and sit in the park, Go find some solitude somewhere, musicians and singers, and let the Father talk to you. It's that simple. Quit over-spiritualizing this. Quit making it churchy. Man, the, he's a God that is beyond church. He transcends church. So go somewhere. Sit down. Be quiet. Let him talk to you. Let him revive you, rejuvenate you, and let him get you right again, and then come back to what you do so that you can do it. So anyway... This week, I'll let you know when and who I'll be talking with at the same time. Love y'all. I know it's been long, but uh, um, I'll talk to you next time. All right? Thank you very much.